Hi, this is Callan Bentley. Welcome back for another Smart Figure. After watching this video, you'll have a better sense of the importance of the process of partial melting in determining igneous rock compositions. The basic idea behind partial melting is this, that you can have some original rock and then through the process of partial melting, you can separate that rock into two components. A solid residue that's going to have a composition that's more mafic, more iron and magnesium rich than the original source rock, and then also a magma, a melt, that is going to be more felsic or more silica rich than the original source rock. So this idea is actually suggested by Bowen's reaction series. You'll recall that Bowen's reaction series was a, a series of experiments that were done by a fellow named Bowen, and he determined that certain minerals will crystallize at high temperatures. So at the very highest temperatures of his melting experiment, he found that olivine and calcium-rich plagioclase feldspar were the first minerals to crystallize. And then down at the very bottom end of Bowen's reaction series, he found that minerals like quartz and muscovite, mica, and potassium feldspar were the last to crystallize. We can flip Bowen's reaction series on its head by, instead of thinking of a cooling magma, think of a warming set of rocks. And in this warming set of rocks, we'll find that some of those minerals are susceptible to melting at lower temperatures than their neighbors. The ones that are going to melt first are going to be these ones down here at the bottom, the quartz, the muscovite mica, and the potassium feldspar. And of course, those are all minerals that are typical in felsic igneous rocks. If we have a source rock which is full of minerals like olivine, quartz, plagioclase feldspar, potassium feldspar, pyroxene, and amphibole, and we subject it to some sort of intermediate temperature conditions, the potassium feldspar, the amphibole, the quartz are all going to melt, whereas the plagioclase, the pyroxene, and the olivine are all going to stay solid because the rock never got hot enough for them to melt. So in this way, we've separated our original source rock into two final rocks. Another way to think about this is to look at a pressure temperature plot for the Earth's interior. So basically, temperature is increasing from left to right, and then pressure is increasing from top to bottom. And you'll see here that we've got the geothermal gradient, basically how hot the rock is for any given depth. That's compared to the melting curve for the mantle rock peridotite. So basically over here, we've got where the peridotite begins to melt, and then over here is where the peridotite has completely melted. So the yellow domain is 100% magma, the green domain is 100% solid rock, and the orange domain in the middle is the domain of partial melting. So let's examine a couple of tectonic situations where this might occur. The first is at an oceanic ridge where we see divergence producing decompression melting of the underlying mantle. What's happening here, if we look over on our diagram, is that we have changed the geothermal gradient. So instead of being relatively cold at a given depth, we see that it's relatively warm at that same depth. And so magma is being produced in this little zone in here. Of course, Divergent boundaries aren't the only place we see magma being produced. We also get it at subduction zones, at convergent boundaries. And here the cause is a little bit different. It's actually due to water that's being driven from the oceanic crust. And that water lowers the melting temperature of the overlying mantle. So basically what that does is it shifts over the, uh, the line where we get partial melting. And now that line is below the geothermal gradient. So what we're going to see is we're going to get partial melting generated in that area there. So you could tell yourself a story uh, that would be something like this in terms of relating one kind of partial melting to another. You could have partial melting of peridotite in the mantle, and that would generate a basaltic magma. So the basalt is actually like distilled from the peridotite. That basalt would move up through the overlying mantle, and then it could pool up or pond at the base of the crust. There, the heat would be transferred to the overlying crust, and because that crust is made out of more felsic rock than the underlying mantle, that means that that more felsic rock might melt. It's made out of lower melting temperature minerals, and then that is going to produce felsic magma that can then rise through the crust to produce a volcano. Let's test yourself here. How can we relate this rock, the peridotite of the mantle, to this rock, and to this rock. Well, 
Hopefully you answered that peridotite is the rock that makes up the mantle. By partially melting the mantle, we can generate the rock that makes up the oceanic crust, basalt. And by partially melting that, we can end up producing the rock that dominates the continental crust, which is the rock granite. Hopefully you got that right. Thanks very much for your attention. This has been another Smart Figure.